Coming up on Tech News Weekly, YouTube changed its terms of service and people are kind of freaking out. Also, suspicionless phone and laptop search at the border has been ruled unconstitutional. Uh, we take a first look at the new MacBook Pro 16-inch laptop that just came out. Motorola announced its retro-looking Razer phone. It's foldable. And Apple finally released its health research app. That comes up next on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 108, recorded Thursday, November 14th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Taylor Store. Taylor Store makes high quality dress shirts that are fully customizable by you. With their exclusive trial price, each new customer gets their dress shirt starting from $39. From the basic essentials to the most high end details, Taylor Store has got you covered. Go to taylorstore.com slash TNW, offer code TNW. And by Cashfly, give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by Ring Central. With Ring Central, you'll get everything you need in one place for your business communication needs. With all in one cloud phone, video conferencing, and team messaging, staying connected has never been easier. Save with their holiday bundle offer and don't pay until 2020 when you go to ringcentral.com slash TNW. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news each week. I'm Micah Sargent. I'm Jason Howell. And Micah, I never told you that I, this is the first time I'm ever telling you this, but I made a protein shake this morning uh -huh. and I put a banana in it. <gasps> nice. You got to get that potassium in there. Ah, yeah, it was delicious. Very good. Very All good. All right. It gave me the energy to start this first interview. YouTube dropped a terms of service bomb earlier this week and creators lost their ever love in mind. Uh, they're worried about the changes and how that might directly impact their ability to monetize their content or even prevent them from creating content in the first place. Joining us to talk a little bit about this, make sense of the changes, is Matt Binder from Mashable. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. It's fantastic to get you on. I'm happy that you could uh, take time for us today. Thank you. So first of all, explain what these new terms actually say. I feel like there was a lot of confusion, a lot of jumping to conclusions, mm -hmm. and maybe it's unwarranted. Maybe it's not. But let's start with the terms specifically. What what exactly do they detail? Right. So the update doesn't actually go into effect into December, on, until December 10th. But, you know, they gave everyone a heads up that these terms were gonna be updated. And YouTube says that it's basically the exact same terms just written in a, in a way that's easier for, you know, lay people like us who aren't legal, uh, you know, professionals to understand. And there was a section specifically in these terms worded in a way that was never before seen in YouTube's terms of service. And it's this specific term uh, section that, you know, caused the controversy online where people completely freaked out. And let me read it verbatim so we can, you know, speak exactly how YouTube wants us to speak about it. Uh, YouTube may terminate your access or your Google accounts access to all or part of the service if YouTube believes in its sole discretion that provision of the service to you is no longer commercially viable. Mm -hmm. And it's those last four words that sort of really struck everybody, no longer commercially viable. And people were reading it as such where, you know, if YouTube determined that your, you know, if your creator, if your channel wasn't making them money and maybe it was costing them more than it was worth, they could just terminate your access to your account. Or, you know, if you're a viewer and you're just watching YouTube video after YouTube video and say you're using an ad blocker or something and they're not making any money off of you, they could terminate your account for that too. That's what, that's what the read was. Mm -hmm. Now, YouTube is saying that, you know, these examples aren't necessarily the case. They're not planning to change anything in terms of how they, you, uh, you know, how they serve the product and in terms of how they let people use the product. But I think, you know, there is, there is I, th I think it was overblown, but there is good reason to worry about these sorts of things. Now, in light of all of this, with everybody kind of freaking out about the, the term commercially viable, like I, I feel like YouTube 
YouTube came out after the fact and, and kind of said, don't worry, we're not changing anything. But still that like that's there and it's open to interpretation. Has has YouTube been forthcoming in any way as far as like what constitutes commercially viable? Like I'm yes. trying to understand like what this protects them from that the terms of service didn't already protect them, them from because certainly there was something in the terms of service that allowed YouTube to decide we can delete a channel uh, when X, Y, and Z happens. What's the difference? Right. Right. They had sent me uh, two statements, which are published in the piece I wrote. And uh, one statement is basically that, you know, they reiterate the change which was just made to make the terms easier to read and that they're not changing the way the product works or how they collect data or any of our settings. And then in an additional follow up, they explicitly said that the terms of service uh, does not mean anything about uh, making money and that uh, they make discontinue certain YouTube features. Uh, that are outdated or have low usage, and they're saying that's what that meant. But this is sort of my thing with it. I noticed that you know other outlets also said you know how um, you know YouTube had some sort of language that was similar to this in previous terms, and how the language was rewritten that just gives them a little bit more leeway. Now, for me personally, I didn't mention that in my piece because my read of it is that I mean that's what terms of service are. They're yeah. words, and lawyers who create these terms of service use these specific words for good reason. And if the terms are rewritten in a way that gives YouTube a little bit more leeway in certain areas, then to me, that's a change of terms. So, I mean, I don't think there's ever been anything quite like this, uh, regardless, I mean, I've looked through the, uh, the current and soon to be out of date terms, and there's no mention of uh, commercially commercial viability or anything like that. So, I mean, YouTube, I believe YouTube when they tell me that they don't mean it that way and that they're going to continue the way things are. But the terms are written in the way that they still are for December 10th. And again, I mean, lawyers and legal professionals write them in, in these ways for reason. And who knows down the line, year, two years, who knows? They might want to argue that these terms mean what the you know the dictionary definition of these words are in the terms yeah so we've seen before youtube does a thing and it is not popular or something happens on youtube and it is not good and the community reaches out sometimes over and over and over and over again before anything ever changes or uh, YouTube says anything. I'm curious, with this uh, with this recent thing, obviously the journalists who are sort of looking into it and as you have been asking for comments and feedback, uh, you've gotten this response that says, yes, the wording has changed, but the terms of service have not. Are we seeing any change anywhere on, on that front of the communication? Or is it just like, it seems as if everybody's gotten the memo that works at YouTube. If somebody asks about this, then the response always is, we haven't changed the terms of service. Uh, it's just the wording that's changed. Or are we getting anything as, especially the community, the creator community is reaching out and talking to, I think it's like Team YouTube or something. I don't know if that uh, Twitter account still exists, but in in times past it seems like some people have been able to get a uh not party line response depending on who they were asking or are we just looking at a full swath of the same thing over and over right the team youtube account still exists and it, it is that is the account that specifically said that this you know this new terms of service has nothing to do with making money and i mean commercially viable i mean that's making money. I mean, it may not be, a you could read it and maybe it's not a direct, you know, exchange of money, but, you know, commercially viable. If, uh, let's say a channel uh, creates some sort of content that causes advertisers to flee, uh, YouTube might want to decide that channel was no longer commercially viable, which would be for the reason that it affected YouTube's advertising revenue. Um, I mean, it seems like the, the, the idea is that this has nothing to do with uh, a change in, uh, you know, the leading accounts that aren't making that money. I mean, a generous read from my interpretation would be, you know, if a YouTube account out there all of a sudden decides it wants to start live streaming a white supremacist show, and, you know, advertisers don't like that this show is on YouTube, so they decide they don't want to advertise on YouTube, I would say that's a, you know, a pretty uh, good explanation for YouTube wanting to cancel the account belonging to the white supremacist show. But again, that's just their read of it, and that's my generous interpretation of it. The way it is written, it is really open, and you know, people can argue that 
you put your, your you put this stuff on any of these uh, social media uh, platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. They basically own it because at any time there it is within their right mm -hmm. to shut your account. True, but I mean, as a user, the real like all we have really is the terms of service. So if something in the terms of service is worded in a way that causes concern, I think creators and fans of these channels, I'm, I'm a fan of YouTube, I use YouTube, both as a viewer and creator, we should be concerned about these things because again, it, it terms are pretty much all we have to, to argue over because that's all they lay out for us in plain wording as to how they're gonna run their platform. Yep, and those words are enforceable and that is the point. So I guess uh, the long game is what we'll be paying attention to. <laughs> on this one. Right. Uh, Matt Binder from Mashable, thank you so much for hopping on with us today. We really appreciate it. Where can people follow you online if they want to follow your work? You can find me at Matt Binder. You know, I tweet out all my Mashable links and all the other fun tech stuff I come across. So uh, at Matt Binder on Twitter is the best way. Right on, Matt. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate we it. We do appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Now, coming up, a federal court says it's unconstitutional to search travelers' phones and laptops without reasonable suspicion. Well, we'll learn what that exactly means shortly. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Taylor Store. Taylor Store offers high-quality made-to-order dress shirts for both men and women that are fully customizable and tailored to your measurements. Also, they're a 100% carbon neutral business. They're challenging the traditional fashion industry with the new way to purchase clothes. Ready-made garments and off-the-rack sizes have no place in the modern world, by golly. And especially not in my world, because I am happy with uh, Taylor Store's options. People are individuals, and Taylor Store embraces individualism. They embrace and they celebrate it. There are virtually endless options to choose from. They have a selection of finished designs that can be directly purchased or used as a starting point for customization. That's my favorite way of doing things, is to start off with one of their options and then take it and tune it exactly how I want it. Their perfect fit guarantee takes away the risk of ordering. If your shirt does not fit as you'd like, they'll remake Make it for free. All you do is snap two pictures of you wearing the shirt that you don't like the fit of. They make the necessary adjustments and they send you a new shirt promptly at no cost. And there are no returns. You don't need to worry about it. Sometimes I've had that kind of keep me from wanting to make a return is the, the mm. whole or to get something new. The whole process of doing the return is kind of ugh. But here at Taylor Store, you don't have to worry about that. The faulty shirt is yours to keep or give to charity if you want. Now, this is where Taylor Store gets super cool. They have this app called Size Me, and it revolutionizes the measurement process using advanced technology and algorithms. You don't need to pull out that tape measure and, and wrap it around your arms and ask somebody to hold it while you uh, turn to the side or anything like that. No, you download the app, you set it up against a wall, you stand in front of it, you take a photo from your front and a photo from the side, and then you let their algorithm precisely calculate your clothing measurements it just takes a few seconds. So you, after you have that profile, you hop online, you log in, and you pick out the shirt that you want, make it exactly how you want it, and then you say, oh yeah, that's that profile that I created in the, the Size Me app. Boom, it's got your measurements. You don't need to worry about adding anything else. Gone are the days when custom made-to-measure shirts were an item of luxury. Wherever you are, look and feel your very best in perfect fit clothes made only for you by Taylor Store. I've been so happy with, uh, I've, I have like three Taylor Store shirts now, and they all fit me perfectly, which is unfortunately kind of a difficult thing for me. Uh, if, if I get shirts that are long enough to fit my long, lanky arms, then the shirt is usually too big around my torso and chest, and it's just a nightmare. I put on these shirts, they fit perfectly, and I was so happy. And I also got a uh, wool sweater from Taylor Store that is so comfy cozy now that uh, the cold months are coming on. And I just saw that they launched some flannel shirts on their site that I'm going to probably have to get too because <laughs> I can't help it. I mean, it's cold months. It's cold so. months. Yeah. yeah. You got your flannel. You're yeah. Rocking. You know, yeah. you know, I like me some flannel. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm guaranteed you have to check it out. Flannel is fantastic. Yeah. With their exclusive trial price, each new customer gets their dress shirt starting from only $39. I can't tell you how great a deal that is. That's 50% off the regular price. You go to taylorstore.com slash TNW with offer code TNW to get yours. You're also going to get free shipping. So 50% off the regular price and free shipping. Holy moly, you've got to just try this. Terms and conditions apply. That's taylorstore.com slash TNW with the offer code TNW. 
Experience the unrivaled fit and comfort of Taylor Store's hand-picked fabrics for yourself. All right. Uh, thank Taylor Store for their support. So a uh, very interesting ruling happened uh, just yesterday. The federal court here in the U.S., uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, had a rule about suspicionless searches of phones and laptops at the border. Basically, this was ruled unconstitutional. Joining us to talk about this is Sophia Cope from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Welcome to the show, Sophia. Hi, everyone. It is great to have you here, and, uh, it, and especially because the EFF was so close to this ruling. You were working, um, working directly on this case. So let's take a step back a little bit and talk about the case behind the ruling. What can you tell us about kind of the setup for this case and how this came to be? Sure. So back in 2017, and so it's been a couple of years that we've been litigating this case, we filed the initial lawsuit in federal court in Boston. And uh, we filed the lawsuit on behalf of 11 clients, um, or we call them plaintiffs. Um, and all of them were U.S. citizens, uh, except for one uh, was a green heart, is a green card holder. And they all had their devices searched or seized at uh, U.S. borders. So uh, that includes the land borders, as well as international airports, um, where the first uh, point of entry into the United States is uh, is an airport. Um, and they, like I said, they all had their devices searched or seized, and they felt like this was a significant privacy invasion. So they had all reached out to us or also ACLU, uh, and we agreed that this this uh, the, these policies and procedures of DHS and, and, and the border agency, CBP and ICE, were um, outrageous, if not also con unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. So we decided to sue. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, kind of joining this, this alliance of the EFF and the ACLU and your efforts. Obviously, that uh, your efforts were a success. Like, as you kind of ventured down this path, like, were you hopeful or, or did, I mean, sometimes I imagine you go into these things <laughs> expecting that it's just, it's just bigger than, than what you can pull off, but I'm happy that you do it. Like, were you hopeful that you could actually affect change in this, in this case? We, we were hopeful, but what we do as um, nonprofit organizations that focus on civil liberties, we take cases that we, what we call, um, we call it impact cases. So mm -hmm. they might be uphill battles, but if we are successful, we will, positively impact not just the rights of our clients, but the rights of everyone in the country. So that's how we viewed this case, that um, it was a, a bit of an uphill battle um, in terms of existing case law not being uh, very supportive of privacy rights at the border. But we felt like um, the violation of privacy in people's devices was something unique and different and unprecedented. So there is longstanding um, case law that says very clearly that if border agents want to search a piece of luggage, uh, so I'm sure many of your viewers have come back into the United States, they've had to go through customs. Well, mm -hmm. during in, during the customs process, border agents can search through luggage to see if you're bringing in anything unlawful um, or otherwise called contraband. And they can do that without any suspicion of wrongdoing on your part at all. Like they, they can do completely random searches. They can do searches based on mere hunches. Um, or they could actually have, um, you know, a, a lot of information that suggests that you might be transporting something illegal. Um, but the point is, is that really they, they can do completely suspicionless searches of luggage. And so the agencies were trying to apply that same rule to devices. Uh, and um, we argue that that is just not uh, appropriate under the Fourth Amendment, that Fourth Amendment analysis requires looking at the privacy interest and in the thing that's being searched. And because devices can hold, you know, hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes of data and can reveal everything from, you know, our most intimate correspondence to facts about us, like our health conditions, uh, our financial status, our political views, etc., that searches of devices were just completely different than luggage. And the, and obviously the courts agreed um, in the end. Um, and so 
I guess my question here is maybe a little from a suspicious front. Like, like sometimes when, <laughs> when rulings happen like this, I'm like, okay, well, law is complicated. So sure, this particular ruling says this, and I want to believe that this will happen, but there's got to be some way around this. Like people who are absolutely willing to, to, to make this happen, I you know, maybe it's the pessimistic side of me that's like, okay, well, how else are they going to make this happen then uh, to get around this? Do you envision that? Is this a pretty airtight kind of ruling as far as that's concerned? Or do you envision any wiggle room? Ha. Huh. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's right. a good question. Um, so, well, let me just, let me unpack what the ruling actually says that, that, and, that's then, good. and then we can kind of like go from there. So, um, and bear with me, I, I, I you know, I, I want to unpack this for your viewers cause sure. you know, we, we actually quite happy with, with the ruling. Um, so, uh, she did say that wholly suspicionless searches of people's digital devices at the border, um, are unconstitutional under the fourth amendment. But then the rule that she, uh, stated was that all device searches require reasonable suspicion that the device contains digital contraband. So, what that rule means is a, a couple different things. So, first is that totally suspicionless or random searches, or even searches based on hunches or even the biases of the border agents, are are not are are no longer constitutional, right? Mm. So. Um, that, that's huge. Um, then what she did is that she collapsed the distinction between manual and forensic searches. Um, so that way, and this maybe goes a bit to your question, agents can't sort of do, uh, can't get around a higher standard. So what do I mean by that? Existing CBP and ICE policies have required reasonable suspicion for forensic searches. So that's basically where they take your smartphone or your laptop, they, you, they plug in a separate forensic computer, you know, with forensic software, mm -hmm. and they can sort of more efficiently search through your hard drive. Um, their policies generally require reasonable suspicion to do that. The problem is that most searches of digital devices are manual, where they ask you for your password or ask you to unlock your device and they just sort of tap through it, mouse through it, et cetera. And so by her requiring reasonable suspicion for both manual and forensic searches, there's no way for the agents to get around this higher standard by choosing a different method of search. So that was also a huge aspect, a yeah, hugely important positive. aspect of her ruling. Um, and then Finally, the fact that she narrowed the scope or the purpose of device searches to only finding evidence of digital contraband, that's also hugely important because what CBP and ICE have been doing is accessing people's data uh, for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons is just to kind of see what people are up to, basically conduct fishing expeditions mm -hmm. to see if maybe they can uncover some kind of evidence of wrongdoing. But we argue that that's completely untethered, sort of completely disconnected from the purpose of border searches in terms of uh, border security. Mm -hmm. And she agreed with us. And so she said, because border searches, even of luggage, have traditionally been uh, intended to interdict contraband, she applied that same limiting uh, rule to the device searches. And so that's that's hugely important because we've seen searches, you know, involving text messages and emails and metadata like location information that clearly have nothing to do with interdicting contraband. And in this case, she had mentioned a couple examples, so child pornography, unfortunately, is a very common form of digital contraband, but possibly also um, uh, copyrighted information, so un unauthorized copies of digital media, um, maybe classified information, but that's, you know, going to be very rare mm -hmm. <laughs> situation. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's that's the the whole of the of the uh, of the ruling. And overall, we think it's quite, quite good. That's a fantastic run through. Very comprehensive. I appreciate that. Do you uh, do you expect this to, uh, at some point, make its way to the Supreme Court? This kind of seems like one of those cases that, that huh. might, uh, might end up going all the way as far as that's concerned. That's a possibility. So the next step 
for this case is that we are in uh, current negotiations with the government. The Justice Department, of course, is representing DHS, CBP, and ICE. Um, and we have to present a proposal for a final order uh, that the judge will have to sign. And so we'll see wh what that looks like. Um, also, uh, the government has uh, 60 days to decide whether or not they're going to appeal. And um, we uh, that, that will influence kind of, you know, what, what we do moving forward as well. It's possible that we could cross appeal to see if we could get a higher standard, such as probable cause. Um, so, and then that appeal will go to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the, the federal appellate court uh, in the New England area. And then based on, you know, what the First Circuit does, then it's possible we could then appeal to the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court typically decides to take cases if there is what they call a circuit split. That means the federal appellate courts, there, um, uh, there are uh, 12 circuits around the country that, that you know, split up the states. And so if there are a handful of circuit decisions on one side of the issue and a handful on the other, that's called a circuit split. And so the Supreme Court often likes to take cases where there's a circuit split. And there is already a circuit split developing on this issue. You have the Ninth mm -hmm. Circuit and the Fourth Circuit um, having already required reasonable suspicion for forensic searches. And then you have the Eleventh Circuit that said no suspicion is required for any kind of border device search. So depending on you know what the um, what the first circuit does it's it's very possible that this would be ripe for Supreme Court review got it well you guys have to be uh, super proud of uh, being able to get it to this point you fought for yeah it. it's exciting yeah it's super <laughs> exciting Sophia cope with the electronic uh, electronic frontier Foundation thank you so much for taking time to be with us today Sophia thank you Appreciate my it. pleasure all right we'll talk to you soon all right coming up Apple released a new MacBook Pro that I want. Just saying, just throwing that out there. <laughs> we'll see what happens with that. Renee Ritchie is going to tell us all about it next. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience that they want. You can power your site and your app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than the competition, no matter what industry your business is in. If your website is directly tied to company revenue, you can give you the customers, your customers, the fast downloads that they need with Cashfly. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. It's backed by a 100% SLA. Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are or what device they're on. So you can join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, and Ars Technica. Of course, put Twit on that list as well. We've been hosting our podcasts, uh, all of our podcast content, our media, audio, and video on Cashfly for a decade. Uh, every month, our viewers, our listeners, they're downloading petabytes of data fast and flawlessly, and that is because of Cashfly. We would not exist without Cashfly. So say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or worse, even daily, trying to track your CDN usage. There's no billing spikes, so you get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs based on yearly usage trends. And on average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. You can imagine what you could do with that 20% in your time. And just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. So you can see if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. Uh, learn more by going to twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank Cashfly for their support for their like decade of support yeah. uh, with Twit. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Cashfly. All right. So as you mentioned, there is a new MacBook MacBook Pro. MacBook, MacBook Pro. 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 Uh, 16 inch MacBook Pro that uh, Apple is touting as a, a true pro machine. Mm -hmm. um, Looks like it is. I was on MacBreak Weekly on Tuesday and a certain somebody was not there. Um, but he is here today with us and that is iMore's, iMore and Vector's Renee Ritchie. Hello, Renee. What's up, Renee? 
Hi, Mike. Oh, oh, there it is. Look at that. Well, inverted arrow keys. Where there, are they? there they are. There's my future. Oh, there you <laughs> are, future. An escape key. Escape, escape key. key. Oh. A separate, a separated uh, touch ID. It's got the whole yeah. deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you, of course, for being here with us. Um, and let's get right into things. Uh, obviously, the big, the big deal. Well, the big deal to what one would think is the overall narrative is the keyboard. We have a yes. different mechanism than we have been used to in models past. So tell us a little bit about this. Is this a cherry switch key smush <laughs> situation? Is what it, are we working with here? Yeah, are we going to hear a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when we're tapping? Is it Apple Extended 2? Did they bring back the Apple Extended 2 <laughs> is what you're asking. <laughs> um, yeah, so what they did was they went back to scissor switches, which is what they had in the 2015 and previous MacBook Pros, but they used the Magic Keyboard, which is what you get with an iMac, for example, as the inspiration because – you know, they, a lot of people really love that keyboard and they were just sort of scratching their heads as to why Apple never put it in a laptop. So they started with that, but they had to change it a little bit because the Magic Keyboard is angled, it's not flat, and it has to go on a laptop. So they're using the scissor switches, but they made a new rubber dome that sort of locks the key out at the top to give it more stability. So it feels like a scissor switch keyboard, but it's not all loosey-goosey like the older MacBook Pros were. So I like it. It's almost, it's, it's almost like a hybrid feeling between the butterflies. It has a stability of the butterflies, but hopefully the mechanical durability and reliability of the scissor switches. Beautiful. So you have used it. You've you've played with it. Yes. You've typed on it. And yes. you see, you and I are in the same sort of uh, mindset where I can, uh, right now I've got a, a Surface Laptop 3 that I'm typing on um, and it's fine. And then I'll switch to an iPad and it's fine, the iPad keyboard. Yes. And so I don't really notice too much of a difference uh, between keyboards, but some people do. Uh, and I, have you have you done any have you done any dust tests? <laughs> have you tried eating one of those horrible granola bars above it and seeing uh, how things go after that? I, I just I guess what I'm asking really is, did Apple talk about not just the redesign of the keys, but more importantly, the um, what they've done to make sure that we don't have a space bar that doesn't press down after a while or a K key that won't type anymore. Yeah, so I mean, there's several things uh, and the the problems with the old keyboard were multifaceted and I think that's part of what uh, led to a lot of the pe you know, people saying, I have it, I don't have it, I have different issues. These have the scissor switches, they've got an extra millimeter of travel. So uh, previously things were not supposed to get into the butterflies, but it turned out they did and then they couldn't get out again. So because these have an extra millimeter in them and there are scissor switches, anything that goes in, like the older 2015 and earlier MacBook Pros, it should come out again. Ah. And also because it's using rubber for the uh, domes and not metal, the previous metal would sort of fatigue and then it, it wouldn't register or it would double register. Uh, the newer material is better for that with the butterflies, but these are rubber, so they should be whole realms better again in terms of durability. Now, I found this to be the most wild aspect of, of the MacBook Pro, the new MacBook Pro, is the focus on audio, both speaker-wise yeah. and microphone-wise. So... You put together, as you do, uh, for, for Vector, uh, a video review or, or first look or whatever you want to call it of the 16-inch MacBook Pro. And it's my understanding that you recorded most of the audio in that video using the built-in microphones on the 16-inch yes. MacBook Pro. Tell me everything there is to know. How were you able to do that and still put out a video that sounded good? What is going on in there? So there's two things. One is the new speaker system, and I'll just touch on that briefly because it's, it's a shorter story. Apple built this huge lab when they were making the the HomePod and the AirPods. It's outside of Apple Park, and it's it's like a minus two decibel room and a, a zero floor. It's just one of those giant sound labs. And Apple Engineering has been working there for years on all sorts of stuff. And they brought in the MacBook Pro, and they've created two uh, woofers, one on top of the other, that can that provide deeper bass but cancel out the vibrations. So if your MacBook oh. is rocking, you know you can still keep typing. Uh, and they also have a three speaker array that uses um, technology. Apple has its own technology, but also uses Dolby Vision, uh, Dolby Atmos if it's available to That's 3D crazy. positionally place. All 
audio <laughs> around you. And because they know where your head is, you know, is likely to be relative to a laptop, they can really 3D play sound. So it sounds like almost as good as a HomePod. We were playing Star Wars stuff on it earlier, and it's it's hard to believe this sound comes from a laptop. Wow. Uh, I don't know how often you'd use it as your main stereo system, but if you ever need to, it works really well. And the mics are the same thing. Apple doesn't mean you to replace, you know, like we have these fancy XLR mics. They don't mean you to replace that or your good USB podcasting setup. But if you're on the road, if you're out and you just need to record something, they want you to be able to make it sound as good as possible. So they've put what they call USB quality, like it should be similar to what you get with a Blue Yeti or something, right into the MacBook. And they went for really high signal to noise ratio. So you don't get the sort of clipping and you don't get active noise canceling, which some other sort of lower end uh, USB microphones try to do. It just, it sounds really good. And I recorded everything after the intro and before the outro completely on that, spe on that uh, microphone system. Wow. Yeah. So one of the things that's a little bit out of place on this uh, pro laptop is the 720p uh, yes. eyesight camera. Wah, wah, wah. Now, I obviously there's this, there's a difference between what Apple says, what Apple does, what you know that that side of things, and then also sort of the reading between the lines and trying to figure out strategy. And you, as an Apple analyst, I'm asking you for that second one. What do you think is the thinking there? Why are we not seeing an updated uh, webcam mechanism? I, I, I don't know. Maybe Apple did comment on that and I'd love to hear that, but I'm more interested sort of you from the analyst perspective of, is there a reason why we still have a 720p camera in um, uh, a laptop that has a fantastic uh, <laughs> microphone and speaker system? Yeah, I think it, it simply is, you know, they go through their list and they get to a certain amount of things they can get done in any given time. And that just didn't make it onto the list, which me personally is, is a crime against the machine because it's so good. And what I mentioned in my feedback was, you know, that you, they should take the same rationale they're using for that microphone system and apply it to the camera. And I understand that they have these really, really thin lids and that you can't, there's not a lot of Z index for, for good glass in there. Mm. But I would even take a minor bump at this point, but give me a camera. 4K if you can, that is good enough that if I ever have to just sit down and do a talking heads video or I'm traveling and I really want to do Mac Break Weekly, I can call in and I will not completely embarrass myself in front of Alex Lindsay by using the camera that they put into this $3,000 machine. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm like thinking through my head like, okay, so the, are the, the Venn diagram of the like creators that would get this, that would totally agree with you. And then there's all the other people that would get it. They'd be like, I don't care. I just want to make like a Skype call to my mom, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Um, but they'll say, just use your iPhone, but then I'll say that for the mics too. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to put totally. mics in the thing, put the camera in the thing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I, I'm curious to hear your take on the battery because this thing, like, Battery can be kind of a boring thing, but I mean, you know, laptop it's life important. lives and dies <laughs> by the battery life. And this sounds like it has a pretty like big bulky battery. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this battery goes to 100, and that is the legal limit for the FAA. That is as much as you can fly with. And other companies have gone to like 98, 99, and Apple, like, they ran up to the line and stopped exactly at the line. And that does make it a little bit heavier. It's 0.3 pounds heavier than the previous generation, 15-inch MacBook Pro, but it gives you an extra hour of battery life. And that means, like, Wi-Fi browsing. If you're using Final Cut, you know, that that will be relatively less. But it gives you an extra hour. And it, at the end of the day, I think it's a really good trade-off because – Apple has a thin and light machine yeah. and lightness is absolutely a user benefit if you if it's hard to carry if it's hard to use if it's hard to hold up people don't like it but you have a MacBook Air for that if you're going to make a 16 inch MacBook Pro let it be a 16 inch Mac, uh, 16 inch MacBook Pro yeah, yeah, you really forgive a MacBook Pro uh, because it is yes. a pro machine. It is capable of all these things. I have, you know, I have one at home. It's an, obviously a much earlier model, but I forgive it for its weight because it's so <laughs> capable. It's right. just kind of that's part yeah. of that particular brand, that lineup. Yeah, so that would have been that. That is um, my next question. Speaking to performance, so we've we've talked about the battery life, but you as a creator who made the who who recorded the audio using the new MacBook Pro i assume you also edited the video on final cut pro on the new macbook pro i did okay i did and so tell us about that of course with the updates to final cut pro added for this uh, 16 inch machine how is the performance what are we what are we talking about in terms of being able to cut uh 4k video and uh yeah. all of that jazz 
So I mean, F Final Cut is interesting because Apple has invested so much in it pre-rendering, so you don't have like it's just so fast. And they moved it. I think it was a month ago. They moved it completely onto the Metal Engine, mm. uh, which has made it even faster. With this machine, you still have the same Intel ninth generation Coffee Lake refresh Core i7 or Core i9 options. You can turbo boost up to five uh, gigahertz, but because Intel simply hasn't released the tenth generation chips in the in the the exact models that Apple needs for these laptops yet. But what they did was recreate, was redo the entire thermal system. So it has much better throughput. And that means that it can sustain that performance for longer. So if you're doing bursty workflows where it just peaks and, and goes back down and peaks and goes back down, you may not, not, you may not see much difference, but if you're doing a lot of sustained workflows, like if you're rendering things over time or computing over time, then you'll be able to keep that performance for longer. And mine, it just, it flew. I was doing. It's also got better AMD graphics. And the thing I think some people forget about uh, MacBooks is that Apple doesn't really have a CPU and GPU. And the T2 chip is used to offload HEVC encode and decode because Intel's still not very good at that. And it's got special accelerator units. So even when people benchmark, it's hard to tell what exactly they're benchmarking. And Metal and Apple's technologies sort of are a layer in between that and they pick whatever compute unit is best at the moment. So when you take, uh, that's also why Nvidia hates what Apple does and won't, won't be part of it because they want to be Nvidia. They don't want to just be part of a giant hive processing core. Uh, but when you put all this on top of it, I was getting much faster feeds. I ran Blender on it and it was going about twice as fast as the previous generation model. Wow, wow. Are you disappointed in the lack of uh, the missing Wi-Fi 6? I mean, it's uh, it's present on the iPhone 11 lineup, but not here. What do you think about I, that? I, I, theoretically, I mean, it's the same <laughs> right, thing like when theory. I'm upset with yeah, yeah. less LTE. It's like if I'm the only one sitting on a tower, I will notice it. But I just think that in terms of future-proofing, again, this is a MacBook Pro. Yeah. I want to buy it now and use it for five years. And Wi-Fi 6, it's not on a lot of routers now, but in five years, it will be. It and will I think be. it would have been nice, especially because Apple's already shipping products with Wi-Fi 6. That they would. It's, it's those little things, like the lack of the camera, the lack of Wi-Fi 6. But we did get Bluetooth 5. That's sort of Those are the little things, the little splinters uh, that are in my brain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what can you, I, I have no understanding of the refresh rate changes. So this is something that oh, so I assume good, is a very pro feature. You can change the refresh rate of the retina display. Renee, you say it's so good. What, what, it, why is that so good? What is the purpose of being able to change the refresh rate? So you can basically choose between 60 and 48, and you, you can do either the perfect one or I forget what the, the double ratio is. It's like whatever. Uh, 59.94, 47.95. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly that. So let's say you're editing 30 frames per second video, which is what a lot of television um, uses. You can set your refresh rate to that, and you'll see what the video is actually going to look like. But let's say you're editing a movie, and you want to keep it to that traditional 24 frames per second. And it, it's really just that. It's just a tradition. But we're used to seeing that, it's, which is why, like, if you go to someone's house and they have motion smoothing on their TV and you're trying to watch Avengers, it looks like a soap opera, and you just mm -hmm. want to you know, go over there and fix that TV for them. <laughs> this is the same thing. You can you can set the computer to play, to refresh in the rate that you are editing the video for. And it just means that you're seeing what it actually looks like. And that wow. may not matter if you're just uploading to YouTube or not, but if you're using these on production and you're using it as part of a movie workflow or something, it's just, it, again, it gives you that ability to to be more precise with your professional work. That's cool. Understood. Yeah, I like that. Uh, any last questions there, Jason? Uh, when, when can you get me one? <laughs> um... <laughs> Or can you just give me yours? I'm, I'm fine <laughs> taking Or did Georgia that. Dow already take it? <laughs> I can put in a good word with Leo when he gets back. I mean, if he's coming back, looks like he's having so much fun that I, I'm generally worried at this point. He's already ordered his. <laughs> yes, he's already ordered yeah. his. The problem is he'll know that I was fishing for it on this show. Like, it's this is all public. <laughs> so don't do that. It's okay. I'll figure it out all on right. my own. <laughs> we'll, we'll get him. We'll, we'll run a caper and take uh, take Leo's for him. Um, oh, right. oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But totally when when that. is this available? Is it available now? Is it available later? What are we? Uh, what are we talking about there? Available to order starting yesterday, and it'll be in stores. They used to say they say later this week, which usually means Thursday, Friday, and typically Friday, especially in the smaller Apple stores. But you should be able to get it if you walk in on Friday. All right, excellent. Right on. Well, Renee, oh, and I will say it's the same price as the previous one. They didn't add it to the lineup. They didn't hike the price. It is the exact same price that the 15 inch was last week, which I think is pretty extraordinary. That although is you, extraordinary. Although you can stock this thing and get uh, like what. The, 
fully loaded. I think a uh, PC guy in chat said 7490. So, oh, yeah. But yeah, that's just, for 8 terabytes and 64 I, gigabytes, which I didn't ridiculous. even think that they would include on this. So I'm still super happy. Still, that's an impressive cost for a laptop. Yeah. 8 that, terabytes. That, that would last you a while. That would last you six yeah. years, not just five. <laughs> uh, it is interesting they've completely replaced the 15-inch model. It's you yeah. know, 13 or 16 right now. All right. Um, let's see some of this tech trickle down into that smaller form factor. Max it out, Max it out. You, yeah. you know you want to. Go all the way. Go it, all the way, it, go all it, the way. Eight, eight, eight terabytes. terabytes. Holy moly. Oh my goodness. Yes, pre-install oh, well, yeah, that software. Get, oh yeah, go. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I've already got I those thought it would programs. Be 10K, so so I'm, I, to me, it's like it's less than I thought it would be, honestly. I thought it would be closer to 10K max. Though. Yeah, and I think that people kind of uh, ex suspected that this was going to be a more expensive model that would exist separate from the 13 and 15 inch sizes. So the fact that they're bringing it in at the same cost to start with, uh, with 15 inches, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and if you max it out, it is the same price as the beginning Mac Pro. So you have. Oh, that. so <laughs> so which one do you go with, the portable one or the one that's uh, a cheese grater? Can I get that bag and just carry the Mac Pro to Starbucks with me, Micah? Will you socially accept that for me? I will. I you just... know what? I will be the only one socially accepting that for you, but I will do that for okay. you. Yes, I do right, that. I'd be in your corner. Oh, okay. That's you got two you people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Renee, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if people are looking to follow you online, see all of the awesome content you're producing, where can they do that? They can go to at Renee Ritchie on all the social things or imore.com slash vector for the text and youtube.com slash vector for the moving pictures. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have a foldable phone with a heaping helping of nostalgia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm so angry. <laughs> um, but first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Ring Central. Ring Central is the number one global cloud phone system that does pretty much everything. Ring Central allows your business to have effortless communication. So we here at Twit use Ring Central. Uh, they got me set up with it. They got Ant set up with it as newer employees. And yep. so we were able to add very easily to the whole system. Uh, but we've been using it here at Twit for quite a long time, even okay. before I was part of that we. Uh, it's also great on the go. You can work remotely and manage your business from your mobile device by seamlessly switching between between desktop and mobile without dropping a call. So that's really nice. The fact that if I'm out and about and then I come into the office, I can switch that call over to my desktop. You can route calls, you can do video conferences, you can utilize team messaging, you can even do online fax. And it integrates with all your favorite apps, including Gmail, our pals at Zapier, Salesforce, Microsoft Outlook, and more. You can also retrieve voicemail, which has a transcription feature. So maybe you're stuck in a meeting, you get a call and you need to see, oh, is this important? Is this one that I can step out and actually uh, take this call? Well, you can read it and it says, there are donuts in the lobby. And then you're like, oh, I've got a very important call I need to take. I got to get out of this meeting. You can hop out of there and go get your donut. Uh, it's the solution that grows with you and your company. In fact, it's easy to add additional users. As I mentioned, uh, it was a simple process of an email and a click away for Ant and myself. Ring Central, of course, is more than just a phone system. You're going to simplify your workflow so you can connect easily with customers and employees, giving you effortless service. With any mode on any device anywhere, their app provides flawless integration, letting you transition from your personal phone to your computer during a call. Ring Central's app is ahead of its time by letting you send business SMS from your personal phone. You don't even have to transfer your contacts into the app because it automatically populates them for you. And they even let you port existing numbers over from other services. So if you're on an existing service right now and you're like, man, Ring Central sounds awesome, but oh, that's such a process to try and figure out. Do I give my clients new uh, numbers or what do I do here? No, you just port them over. Ring Central makes it easy. It's the complete communication solution from one vendor, and it starts as low as $19.99, saving you money and cutting your phone costs by at least 30%. Plus, they have customer service 24-7 via telephone, live chat, and email if you need them. When you sign up today, you'll get instant access to Ring Central's award-winning, powerful phone system with text, fax, video conferencing, and more. Go ahead and take advantage of their special holiday bundle right now for Tech News Weekly's audience only. And don't pay until 2020 when you go to ringcentral.com slash TNW. That's R-I-N-G-Central.com slash TNW.
All right, Jason, what do you got for us? I'm excited about this one. Motorola is coming out. It wants the world to know <laughs> that it's a foldable phone that's better than the rest. It's also less expensive than the other foldables on the market, but still pretty, pretty, pretty pricey. pricey. Yeah. <laughs> that's not saying much. The Moto Razor was unveiled last night at an event. It's a total nostalgia play. Uh, that kind of attempts to reside firmly in the future, even though it's kind of living in the past a little bit. Yeah. But uh, I'm very curious to know your take on this. It's a, it has a clamshell design similar to the original uh, Motorola Razor from 2014 in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, 6.2 inch. Uh, OLED display on the inside it has a 2.7 inch quick view outer display that does things around notifications, music control, selfie display if you're taking a picture uh, of yourself, that sort of stuff. It has a 16 megapixel camera uh, underneath that outside display. So mm -hmm. you've always got that camera visible and uh, and everything. Uh, but man, when you flip it, like it's got the whole flipping mechanism that we remember from the old school oh, Motorola Razor. It's so pretty. And uh, inside, when it flips out, so that display is one continuous display. And I thought this was really interesting. There was a phone way back when in 2015 called the Droid Turbo 2. And it had something that Motorola was touting at the time. It was kind of new called Shatter Shield. And it was a kind of a tackier more plastic feeling display. It's not glass, but it could withstand almost anything. Like I think, you know, the, the thing that penetrated through it was like a pickaxe, you know what I mean? But yeah. you you drop it on the ground, everything, it wouldn't scratch up. You could hardly even puncture through it. But, it, but the trade-off was that it was more of like a plastic display than it was a glass display. But if, you're, um, if your aim was to find an indestructible screen, like maybe your job is really rough and tumble or whatever the case may be, it was a really great choice for that. And so they had that on a few different phones, Motorola did. And I guess in creating this along the way like their their original vision was not necessarily to do a nostalgia play they just started playing around with kind of foldable concepts and started to realize that um and some of the same people from the original razor are on the the current team started to realize that the design uh, points that they were hitting were kind of veering closer and closer to that original mm. design and they were like wait a minute we could do something with this yes. and totally bring it back. And so they're taking that shatter shield screen and the hinge that they've got created around this makes it so that like on the Samsung Galaxy Fold, the big the big complaint is that when you fold it time and time again, you get that crease, that really ugly crease. And what does that do for the display over the course of a couple of years? Is the display going to start you know, breaking down at that point? Because, I mean, you can only crease so many times. Right. Uh, and that's not good for durability. Well, Motorola has done their own approach on the uh, hinge. I can't remember what they call it. They have a fancy name for yeah, it. Yeah, it's something where there's no... Oh, man, I forgot yeah, to. Yeah, I, I thought I wrote it down here, but it's not in here. But basically, it, it does this sort of thing where the hinge kind of moves out of the way so that the display can curve into it. So the display, even though the phone collapses flat, mm -hmm. the display is never cinching. It's never creasing. It's always just keeping its round structure. And so if you remember a couple of weeks ago, they did a little promotional thing out on social media to like tease ahead to this announcement and it was this super up close like hinge mechanism that no one could figure out that's what they're showing off in that thing because we just didn't know what exactly we were looking at so yep there's there's the hinge right there um there you know there you can find some videos online that, that kind of show it in movement and it's really interesting to watch it move because it it never does the crease. Zero so, gap hinge. Zero gap hinge. I'm sure reviewers are going to have a field day trying to test this out because of all of the bad stuff that happened with the Galaxy Fold right. during its initial uh, launch. You know, can uh, can particulates or can can stuff get in behind the display and warp it? We don't really know that yet, but Motorola seems pretty confident in it and. I don't know. It's an interesting looking it's phone. It's cool looking. Yeah, it's nice to kind of go back to that old design. Now, were you a Motorola Razor user? I did have a Razor. Back yeah. in the day? Yeah, I had a Razor. 2004, um, I think it was, when it debuted. And it was it was that, I, I can't remember who I was talking to, maybe even you, but it's that phone where after you have a heated conversation, then you uh, poof, uh, just fine. slap it down. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't do that with this one though, because you're going to spend a lot of money on it and then you are going to be closing a full screen display. But there's something, so I don't know that I'm super big on the idea of a, 
a phone that's super thin and then you unfold it into a tablet. Yeah, yeah. But this feel, this fold up thing into a just a normal sized phone, but yeah. fold down into something that's even more pocketable. Yeah, it's like kind of neat. It's like it folds down into not quite a square, but yeah, nearly a square. Nearly a square and definitely pocketable. It looks like anyways. Um, yeah, very cool. So, okay. So price, we haven't even mentioned the price, $1,500. And so that's interesting. Like, so you're paying for the kind of the technology behind right. this, the fact that this is a new category. Motorola intends to kind of continue doing phones in this category. I guess that depends on how successful it is. They're banking on the fact that it will be because it was such a successful phone, you know, years and years ago. The problem here, it kind of breaks down a little bit when you start start to look at some of the specifications inside. Um, no 5G, which, I mean, you know, whatever, I, I, I can kind of understand that. Uh, Snapdragon 710, which is a processor from 2018, um, there's been one revision and now there's another revision of this, of this particular processor mm -hmm. on the horizon. So already out of the gate, it's a lower, uh, it's, it's more of a mid ranger processor compared to the premium that we're at the A55 plus the 800 series of the Snapdragon. So you're taking a, a bit of a, like a step backwards as far as like, what's powering the phone that's probably good for battery and that's a good thing because the battery is only 25 10 milliamp hours oh my goodness so it's pretty small but then you look at the design you kind of understand why you yeah. know what i mean yeah. this is one of those put? phones yeah. with that huge junk in the trunk so uh <laughs> yeah where do you put the battery exactly, <laughs> exactly. so and it's going to be exclusive on verizon which also harkens back to yeah, a I was day. Say, that seems very old school. It's <laughs> right? very old school. Uh, we're still doing that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently, I have no idea why they felt the need to do the exclusivity for Verizon, but apparently, it's going to have. It only uses an eSIM, so it doesn't use a physical SIM at all, and that will allow it to also work on AT and T and T Mobile. It can be unlocked via the eSIM, so you could buy it and then use it on another network. Supposedly, mm. it has all the uh, proper internals to support that. So I wonder why they did the Verizon exclusivity thing. I don't know. Uh, money? Yeah, I have money. no idea. You know, maybe they have a good deal with Verizon. I mean, Motorola has done a lot of exclusive stuff with Verizon mm. in the past. If I remember, yeah, the the original Motorola Droid, that was the first uh, Android device that I ever used. And it was an exclusive on on Verizon. Maybe so, they just have like a long contract or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Mor Motorola is owned by Lenovo now. So definitely there's, there've been switches and stuff in, in who owns the company and, yeah. and how it's evolved over time. Uh, who the heck knows? Well, why they chose I, that I imagine there's some, some cost saving totally uh, or cost protection stuff that is involved with that. If yeah. you, you launch on Verizon, Verizon helps you, 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 I'm, you know, those deals that could be put in place to sort of say, we need to make this many, but we don't make enough money to make this many. So let's go ahead and make this many. And if people buy it, then, you know, so it's all about like making sure they've got all the money right where it needs to be potentially. So someone walks, so someone walks into Verizon They're like, I want to get a new smartphone. <laughs> they see the iPhone 11. Mm -hmm. They see the pixel. Maybe they don't even see the pixel pixel. <laughs> This is just not doing so hot. Um, oh, really? Well, I mean, it's it's doing okay. It's it's not it's not a delivering in the same way that Apple's iPhones so are. So Samsung Galaxy. So Samsung. They see the Samsungs, and then they see this one, and this one's more expensive than the Note. Do you really see people no. like spending fifteen hundred dollars on this? I no. don't. No, no. I love this. Yeah. But I think it's too expensive. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is barely a nerd phone. Like yeah. uh, the the folks that I know who would be into this thing are not going to be able to spend $1,500 on a device that's not even the most premium option that's available. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a huge nostalgia play. It feels a little bit kind of um, silly. <laughs> uh, I think it's cool. I, I, as I've seen multiple people make the same joke on Twitter, which is that they say, I don't not like it. And I've <laughs> genuinely seen so many people say that, or I don't not want it. Yeah. And so folks think it's cool, but $1,500 cool. Mm. That's pricey. I mean, that's a lot of money to spend on a smartphone. I mean, and we feel that way about like the premium of the premium. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? The top of the line yeah, iPhone, the top of the line Samsung, have... we feel like $1,000, $1,100. Like that's a lot to yeah. spend on a smartphone, let alone yeah. something like this. Like I feel like- These feel like- um 
You just want people to see it. Yeah, these feel like projects <laughs> yeah. that are taking place in public, and you'll get a yeah. few people who are going to buy it, and that'll help fund future projects. But it just feels a little um, like they let their designers and, and engineers sort of, here, take the keys and turn on the car and go with it wherever you want to go. And I'm then they came they out did. with this on the end. Yeah. I'm happy they Let's did keep that. keep experimenting yes, with this Yes, exactly. Stuff. They're taking risks, um, even though the risk is going back to old technology that worked. But it is a risk in today's uh, kind of smartphone landscape. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Motorola only has around 3% of the handset market currently. M much of what they've been doing lately has been appealing to the mid-range with uh, their smartphones. Um, so this is, this is definitely a little bit of a gamble and I'll be very curious. I hope we can get a review unit of this at some point. Cause I would love to see it. Yeah. I want to see it in person too. Yeah. I will touch it and hold it and hug it. And you'll flip it open and then you'll slam it shut. <laughs> and then I'll say, um, it's broken. Sorry. Bye. <laughs> How about when you hang up on someone by slamming it shut? It doesn't hang up immediately. It tells the other person, oh, you really pissed him <laughs> off. <laughs> yes. Something like that. And yeah, then yeah. it hangs up. Yeah. It's like, you should probably text an apology. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the accelerometers have detected the slamming of this device. You should really text an apology. <laughs> or, oof, harsh. <laughs> that hurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, that's uh, the new Motorola assistant named Marv. Your best friend that will comfort and support you when you get hung up on. Yeah. By, Marv, by, I had yeah. another bad call. <laughs> uh, so on my side of things, I have talked a lot about how I like the way that Apple handles um, health yeah. in, their, in their apps and their services. So Apple has in the past made some big plays in the health space. They launched this device called the Apple Watch so long ago. And at the time it was uh, marketed as the most personal device you'll ever own. And they came to understand that the best thing that it could be was not this most personal device you'll ever own that lets you send your heartbeat to friends and all that kind of stuff and send weird sketches. No, it, the best thing that it could do was be a bit of a, of a health and wellness companion mm. and to be there, not just in terms of tracking your health, but also in, in emergency situations and things like that. And so n these days, they really are shaping the features of the Apple Watch to support those things, whereas in the beginning, they didn't really know. So Apple has long been in the health game. And uh, I, one of the things that we just talked about was how the health app supports health records for the VA. Um, health records are a thing that I've been using for a long time on in, in my iOS uh, system. But Apple at WWDC, I believe it was, it was either there or it was at the last iPhone event, and I can't remember which one, but they announced that they were going to be coming out with uh, what's called Apple Research. And basically, a long time ago, they released this study in partnership with a university to do a uh, heart study. Mm -hmm. And so you could go in and you could sign up to be part of this heart study, and it would use, you know, you give it all the permissions that you want, and then it would use the... Uh, health tracking data, your heart tracking data from your uh, Apple Watch to be sent off and then compared to everybody else who decided to send it in. And of course, Apple, with their focus on privacy, it was all differential privacy and all these things to sort of keep you safe and protected in that way. Um, but it ended up being one of the biggest uh, studies on um, arrhythmias and mm. um, other heart rhythm issues. And, and so it was a pretty great thing. And at that point, they said, hey, we're going to look more into this and see what other studies we can do. And so they just today, um, I downloaded it this morning, they've launched their uh, Apple Research app. And so with the Apple Research app, they've got three studies that they're doing right now. The Apple Hearing Study that is in partnership with the University of Michigan the World Health and the World Health Organization, excuse me, as well as the Apple Heart and Movement Study, which is in partnership with the American Heart Association and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then the Apple Women's Health Study, which is in partner with Harvard School of Public Health, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and of course, Apple itself. So 
in this app, you go in and you sign up for a study and it gives you all of the information based on where you are. So being in California, there are specific rules that I, right. rules and protections that we have here. It tells you, Hey, as a Californian, here's what you, what protections you have. And you have to sign the page using your, your fingerprint or not your fingerprint, but writing it out with your finger goes to the next page. It tells you basically everything you need to know. Then it goes through and it tells you this is all of the data that we would like to collect for this study. Here's where it goes. Here's how you can revoke it, yada, yada, yada. Um, what I found nice about this is I am always, I will always as much as I can and with my my personal privacy in mind, want to contribute to any health study that exists. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that it is... I think that it is important, and I think that if you feel comfortable doing show, so, you absolutely should. I consider it among the same as being um, an organ donor. Like, I, I mm -hmm. will always do that if I can, um, and the same goes here. I want to be able to provide uh, depersonalized data so that these very smart folks who are working on these things have as much information as they possibly can to learn about the human body. Um, and so what, what's really nice about it is Apple, as you're collecting information, it will save that information, like my demographics, for example. And then I only have to fill that out once. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most annoying things yeah, I think about so totally, signing right? up for studies is every single time having to go through with that survey oh, over and over again. Completely. No, you do it once. And then from each further one on, all you have to do is say, yes, I consent to handing over my demographics. Um always shows you your consent documents that you filled out, like when you filled them out, shows you your signature. You can get notifications for um, like if there are break offs from the study. Mm -hmm. Hey, we noticed that you fit into this particular thing. And so we would actually like to, for example, send you a uh, EKG thing if you want to be a part of that study, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Uh, there's the privacy policy, the frequently asked questions, and then very easy to withdraw from the study. So each of the studies, you just tap the withdraw from the study button. I'm sure there are a few more steps and then you're done. The big red button at the bottom. The big red button yeah. at the bottom lets you uh, go out if you don't want to do it. So yeah, um, there are some tasks that were involved depending on the study. Um, so with the Apple Heart and Movement study, all I had to do was say, yes, I'm okay if um, if you use my Apple Watch information and I will try to wear it as often as possible. With the hearing study, there was a survey that I was asked that was kind of asking about how I listen to sound if I live in an environment that's more noisy or less noisy. So depending on the study, you may have more or less questions, but they make it very simple to answer all those questions. And then uh, the, my favorite section is the your data section, and it shows you what data is being collected, including like your detailed heart rate. And you can basically dig in into everything and see exactly what data is being collected, where it's going, and even export it yourself if you want to. Nice. So yeah, I think um, if you've got an iOS device and you're interested in participating in these studies, then it's a pretty great thing. Um, and I'm, I love this stuff because, like I said, I think that um, it's it's awesome that they're giving you this easy opportunity to do so. But the most important thing is just that we have to, the only way that these studies can, can be life changing to the extent that we would like them to be is if there are enough people, you know, par participating in them. Mm -hmm. And so with a big company, that's got a billion phones in people's pockets, y'all, as Oprah says, um, Apple, partnering up with these companies and saying, yes, we've got that reach. Let's help you get that data for people who want to participate. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And anonymized, um, encrypted, I read. Uh, so definitely paying attention to some of the the touch points that, that people have or the kind of the sticking points that people have with sharing their data, especially when you're talking about health data. Yes. Um, but as you were showing, you know, one, one of the questions that I had, but you kind of demonstrated is how active some of this is, but it looks like some of them, you set it up and you're just kind of feeding data while you're using mm -hmm. your technology in the normal ways that you would. It's mm -hmm. just collecting more information to be applied to these things and other things. It's a little bit more active. Yeah. Right? There are some where you'll get a notification, Hey, can you fill out this, um, you know, this survey of like your activity for the last week or what, or whatever it happens to be. Right, right. Um, I think with the heart health one, if there was ever a time where I had what my Apple watch detect as atrial fibrillation or whatever, then it would say, Hey, what was up with that? And can we have more information there? So yeah, depending on the study, it may be completely, um, a, 
what is the word like an autonomous it runs on its own mm -hmm. um or it may involve some tasks that you complete via uh, questions answered interesting yeah. yeah i mean targeting the iphone for something like this is incredibly smart like you said there's so many of these out there and from a from a privacy standpoint people do really tend to trust Apple. Yeah. So something like this on another platform, I guarantee you there's going to be a lot more pushback, a lot more question, you know, questioning or concerns about like, okay, well, but I'm opening the kind of the siphon, you know, the, the, the pipeline for yeah, if Amazon my health did this data with echo or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. I'd be like, hmm. but yeah, I love it. That's really cool. So, so uh, people who want to find this, they yeah. search for Apple Research. Is that yes. the name of the app? Uh, yeah, it's called Apple Research. Um, so you can just look up Apple Research in the App Store. We'll, of course, include a link in the show notes uh, as well. Or you can head to apple.com slash iOS slash research app. Nice. Very cool. Right on. Thanks and of course, it's free. It's free to, free yeah. to download, free to use, all <laughs> that stuff. It's free for you to share yeah. all of your health yes, information. Yes, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> right on. All right. Well, that is it. Uh, Tech News Weekly publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That's where you can go to subscribe to the show. Uh, we have audio and video formats all displayed out there. It's so easy to just tap and subscribe. We hope that you'll do that while you're there. You can also be a part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv and uh, by going to twit.community uh, and sign up for our forums. Uh, okay. Jason and I are there chatting yes. with people and we see your messages and thank you for uh, your feedback there. We you see can, you. We see you. We know you're there. <laughs> Give us your health. Da -da -da -da. And no, don't do that. Don't do that. No, Apple, please, not us. It's not HIPAA, right. HIPAA compliance. So yes. Don't do that. <laughs> you can also follow us on social media. It's <laughs> at twit on Twitter, at twit.tv on Instagram. And if you want to not tweet at me with your health data ever, please, for the love of all that is good in this world, uh, I am at Micah Sargent. Yeah, and, and don't think that means that you can then send it to me because I don't want it either. I'm at Jason Howell. Uh, thanks to everyone who helps us out uh, each and every weekend here in the studio. John, Jeff, John, Burke, everyone here is fantastic. And we appreciate your help. We couldn't do the show without you. And we couldn't do the show without you either. So come back next week, next week and watch us on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Pew!